Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Claude and I would like to welcome you to Force Landings. Great. We'd also like we'd also like to say we hope you never have to join our club. Would you agree? 100. percent Now it's really funny because right before I came to convention, AOPA magazine came out, and stuck in it was this little thing: 13 lucky steps to a safe forced landing. I'm going to read them, and then Claude and I are going to say which one of these really didn't apply to us. Would somebody let Fritz in? Somebody beating on the door back there. Yeah. It said, to avoid landing downwind, especially in IMC, compare the GPS ground speed to true airspeed. Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right? right. You just about have time to do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> compare GPS heading with your DG to find crosswind direction and strength. Yeah. That was right up on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> find an airport, field, or deserted road if possible. I did that. I, I looked. Okay. <laughs> Remember the closest airport or best landing area may be behind you. Uh, no, not in my case. Yeah. <laughs> Atlantic Ocean. Seat belts as tight as you can stand. That I did. Sweet. Um, stow loose objects. Well, most of mine stowed themselves. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I just take the seat belt. Upon land, once the landing area is made, slow to minimum sink speed, um, it's close to max endure speed, and roughly 1.2 times clean stall well, speed. Well, you kind of do that, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to do any of the calculations. Right. <laughs> Give accurate position report to ATC, including GPS coordinates if you can. I was on the final. <laughs> in my case, as I said in my article, when the engine stopped, I immediately went through an emergency checklist that I learned at Annapolis, and then I tried to make my emergency ATC call, not realizing I'd already shut the mask down, so which why the flaps wouldn't come down, so I had to undo part of that checklist. By the way, not a Navy pilot, but Annapolis class of 77. Flaps to full, which I did on land. I did. Landing gear is a toss-up. Make your best call. I left mine down. <laughs> and then you and I were like this. Try to relax. <laughs> I mean, enjoy the ride, folks. Uh, electrics fuel off and door cracked open. No, All right. That is Can't be for us. Yeah. And cushion face with pillow, folded jacket, or blanket. Mm, did do that either. Um, so this is great if you have the time. Um, Claude will tell you about how much time he had. Not much. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, what happened to me. I was flying from my little field in Howard Field uh, near San Augustine, Florida, to San Augustine. We had some work done on an autopilot. Uh, left the house, what, 9.30 that morning? 8.30. About 8.30 that morning. And uh, uh, airplane was running beautifully. The week before that, I went up to Sanderson, Georgia, I think, and we had the prop Sanders balance. Failed. What was it? Sandersville. Sandersville. About a week before that. Had the prop balanced. The airplane was beautiful. I kept thinking that as I was in final, or not final, um, as uh, I was flying into San Augustine. San Augustine's a controlled field. And they told me I was number three behind a Cessna 150 and uh, some other airplane of some sort. And I pulled the power back to idle, getting behind the Cessna 150. And I, just as I was uh, uh, making a uh, base to final, I went to adjust the throttle. And the throttle went the plunk. And I thought, no, it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I went bonk, bonk, bonk. And then I thought, what else can I do? Mixture, maybe something like that. You know, AG5B is electric uh, mixture. I, I didn't do anything. So I was about 500 feet above. Uh, uh, the ground level by then, 10,000 foot runways right out there where I can see it, and I'm over this swamp. And I'm going down, I'm going down, I'm going down, and I'm pulling the yoke back, pulling the yoke back, I'm going down, going down. And I remember reading uh, Bob Hoover mm -hmm. saying something about flying the airplane into the crash if you're going to crash it. So well, that was kind of going under, into the back of my under mind. control. So I, I slowed it down, slowed it down, put full paps in, uh, flaps in, uh, told the tower that what was going to happen. I said, it looks like I'm going to get wet. I have no power. And uh, I had it probably down to 40 knots or so when I actually hit. Just right before I hit, I yanked it way back. And so it stalled. I hit one of the little uh, islands of grass that you see out in the salt bank marsh. When it hit 
uh, now and uh, AG has uh, had the uh, shoulder straps both sides uh, the retractable kind and that was the only thing that was sore because it, it held me from from hitting the panel I went forward on the on the on the, uh, on the strap but the airplane went up on its nose and I thought for a second as I was looking down at the water that it might stay that way <laughs> uh, but it did it went on over and, uh, and we've all had these discussions about what do you do with a Airplane with a canopy when it goes over, you know, when, you, when, it, when it goes over the back. I'm, I'm of the opinion that you leave the canopy shut. It's part of the in, integral part of the airplane. Uh, so I left it shut. The airplane went over, and there was no way I could open it up upside down in this mud bog that was in it. It was very dark because it was dark salt water, and I'm in the mud. And I couldn't see anything. Now, before this all happened, I did have sense enough to turn off the mask or turn off the, the fuel, all that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, so I tried, to, I was hanging upside down in this thing. I had my foot stuck up in the panel. And I got my foot out, but my shoe was still stuck up there. So I had one, one, one shoe off or anything. But I'm still looking around. I don't see any blood. You know, I'm thinking, I say everything was kind of working. I'm, airplane's not on fire. And then, I'm, then it dawned on me that I might survive this. You know, I'm, I'm going to live if I can get out of this thing. So I popped the, the harness on, on, on the AGs. You didn't really get a phone in, but I popped the harness and the thing comes out. And I, of course, fell into the roof of the, of the airplane. <laughs> and then I'm, I tried kicking the window out. I couldn't kick the window out of that thing. And I, I you know, kicked the passenger side, the pilot side. So I got into the back and I got the baggage door open. Uh, there ain't no way. I could get out. Of <laughs> <laughs> but one thing at least you could see daylight. Well, and I could, and, it, and I, I opened it up. Yeah, and I, and I got some sunshine into the airplane, so I could Not see it. Not underwater, I guess. Huh? Not underwater. Oh well, it was up. It was coming in, and I let the water uh, equalize, and then uh, I, I was fumbling around in the airplane looking for something to break. And uh, the tow bar was back there, so I got the tow bar and I broke out the, the back window, and so uh, then I kind of. Looked at it, see if I could fit it through that. I said, "Well, I'm gonna try anyway." But this stuff, this gooey stuff, was coming in, and uh, so I slithered out uh, out the back window, and I come up on the side of the airplane. I mean, I mean, this is the muck. If, you, uh, if anybody's ever been to St. Augustine, this is on the end of one three when you're coming in the, uh, over over the ocean and then uh, uh, over the salt marsh, and then the salt marsh goes right to the end of the other one. Uh, but got out of the airplane and. Uh, uh, about that time, helicopter was over right on top of them. I mean, these, these people were fast. They got a milk. The uh, St. John's County Sheriff's Department came out there. They dropped the guy down with a wetsuit. He checked me out, and I was sitting there. And I said, "Yeah, I think I think I'm okay." I was covered with mud. All you could see was my eyeballs. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm just covered with mud and, and dirt. And uh, so they they came out with this jet boat thing. And you know, got me off, got us off this island, and got me in. About that time, every news, I mean, <laughs> Channel 4, Channel 12, Channel 47, just, yeah, every news group in Florida was there. And so uh, I was trying to, you know, they were trying to get me away from them. And uh, so uh, uh, the folks at the San Augustine Airport Authority, he kind of rustled me back in the back. And I wanted to call Vernon before he saw this on the news. And so, Anyway, that's the accident part. The accident part actually wasn't as bad as you would think because I wasn't hurt, you know, I got out. And then a little later on, I had to think about what, now what? You know, insurance, FAA, all these things that you've got to go through. You probably, did you deal with the FAA in years? Oh, did I deal with the FAA? Okay, well, that wasn't that bad because they came out immediately. I told them what happened, and uh, the FAA guy was there. I don't know how he got there so fast, but he was there. <laughs> and, uh, he lives for things like that. Right. But the carburetor arm, what caused this thing is, uh, is uh, Jeff Simon the other day, he, he actually had a lot of this. Uh, he, went, he went through it, so I'm not going to go through it totally again. But I had one of those trailer hitch type carburetor arms. If you guys have these on your airplanes, get rid of them. Get the other kinds. Uh, that thing, it had, a, it had a crack in it. There was some corrosion in it. And it just came off, and uh, it came off at an opportune time. I've, I've heard of other people have them come off, but usually, you know, after they've landed the airplane and they go to get the power, they don't move because the things come off. 
Yeah. Fun. When uh, you lost the throttle, were you immediate, was it immediately clear to you you're not going to make the field, or did you think at first you might? For a couple ahead? minutes, I thought I might, but it comes down faster than you think when you just have idle power. Uh, well, I you had idle power. Yeah, I did have idle. It was idle. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the prop was turning just fine. I just couldn't figure a way to get out there and push the throttle. Well, the, <laughs> the other thing is that was the the runway in St. Augustine is up high, you know, the swamp's down low. So in a way, I was thinking about trying to stretch it, but then I thought about what would happen if I got there and just slammed into the side of that yeah. the, that runway embankment. So I thought maybe the water might be softer than that. <laughs> so, uh, but. The actual accident and getting out of the accident, and uh, I was okay. I, 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 you know, I, I uh, refused to go to the hospital. I didn't need that. Uh, you know, had to sign some stuff that the sheriff brought out, and uh, and went through the, the the deal with the FAA. The FAA was very good. They didn't they didn't violate me with any kind of uh, a violation or anything like that. And uh, insurance company was also. Surprisingly, uh, you, you read about all these horror stories. I have Global through uh, Norris, through our, 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 our unit. And uh, well, I got, got that, that afternoon, or actually we got home, Vernon kind of got me after I went. And, you know, we, you probably saw what I remember what I looked like when I was standing there with a big bog of mud. Swamp colored. I was swamp colored, yeah. <laughs> it's and, a swamp uh, thing. Yeah, back in the San Augustine Pilot Association has a showers back there. I've only brought some clothes and I've got it all off. I called the Dow, I can't remember what her name is. Vivian? Huh? Vivian? Vivian? Norris is white? No, no, what Vivian? Uh, I did call, I, I, what I did was I called Global. Oh. And Global gave me the, the uh, a girl in uh, Ormond Beach who was the adjuster. And uh, they called me right back and uh, she, she called me right back and said, what happened? They sent this outfit from, from uh, uh, not Ormond Beach, but Bonnell, Florida, called Command Salvage. They, they were right out there to try to get the airplane out. So they were going to try to get the airplane out and actually save it before the tide came. But, uh, the insurance company, you know, my my biannual was good. You know, I I, uh, the, the, I had every every all all those things were good. I gave them a copy of my medical. My biannual was was in date, and uh, so there was no questions. It was just. What are they going to do? Are they going to pay me off? I had $85,000 total pull on the airplane, which wasn't enough to cover it, by the way. Uh, and I knew that. But I used to just carry the 85 because I always figured, well, if I hit a deer or something, it will cover something like that. I never thought about totaling the airplane and living. Bad attitude. Yeah. So, uh, but we, we discussed it, and Global was all for it. You know, they, they thought it could be uh, resalvaged to, to, to pay up to the 85000 and uh, to salvage the plane. But, uh, I, you know, saltwater intrusion, the avionics were all underwater and everything, so uh, they said it was my fault. So I said, well, okay. So I got a check for $84,000. It was $250 a deductible. $84,750. And, uh, and about, oh, it took about 30 days to get the check from the insurance company. And uh, then went out shopping for, a, for another airplane. But I know it took me a little while to get back into another airplane. Uh, but we did it pretty quick. Remember, we got an assessment. And so it went out about three days later. And yeah. You put it in the back. Yeah. Like yeah. I think if it wasn't for that, I probably would have gotten back into another. One. Uh, but it, uh, it's uh, you, you'd be surprised how you how you act when something like this happens. I I, I, I didn't really panic. It just once it dawned on me that. This was going to happen. You, you kind of resigned to the fact, and then you, your, your training more or less takes over, and you just try to you try to make the, the landing as soft as you as you can. And it probably you know, it wasn't probably like with you, where all of a sudden you hear a bunch of noises. Uh, yeah, well, then was, I had silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it but it, it was. Uh, it, it, I don't want to do it again. Uh, I hope this is a one in a lifetime thing, and I was. Mine's out of the way. <laughs> Statistically, they say that an yeah. engine out happens for once out of every 25 years of flying. That's so, about right. Um, and I don't have 25 years as I'm ahead of the curve. Uh, I, I think <laughs> I am too. Yeah. How many hours are on the pod? 
were on the park. Well, the airplane was fairly new. I mean, when I say new, it was a 91 model. Uh, I put the, uh, I, I bought the airplane with 400 hours on it, and uh, it had uh, around 1,600 hours on it when, when I lost it. And it was the same part? Yeah, I, I mean, how many people changed their throttle cable? I, I, we all did that for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. With a throttle cable linkage, if you change your engine, is that something that's normally changed at that particular well, point in time, or does it kind of live through that? Sounds like a dumb question. Yeah. Well, at annuals, it was checked. You know, yeah. you know, you know, it has that little thing on the end that you screw in, and you. But I mean, if you've replaced your engine, you might still have that same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, there's a, now, like I say, like Jeff said the other day, there's a service kit on this thing. It's well, I can tell you, uh, there's a service kit, and that service kit came out before I crashed this thing. Mm -hmm. It just never got into the mail, mm -hmm. and uh, it, and uh, Garner Rice photocopied it to me like that day. And I said, "This is doing me a lot of good." <laughs> yeah, it got real interested in this. And then about two attorneys called me a little later on. They were real interested in it, too, because they thought that, ha-ha, we could probably go after somebody here if you'd like to do it. But I didn't want to pursue any of that. It's just it's not what I do. I'm going to fix anything. I told them no. I, I wouldn't do anything. You know, I just, I, you know the, uh, the insurance company covered my damage, and, uh, and uh, I was not hurt. And... You know, who are you going to sue? I mean, AG built the airplane. You're going to sue Tiger Airplane? You know, it's crazy. So uh, uh, I didn't I didn't bother bother with that. The news media drove me nuts. Uh, they, they do. They uh, You know, you crash an airplane, it's not, or, you know, even a little thing. Run out of gas with an airplane, you didn't make the news. But uh, this was kind of like, what, it was on the news for like a week, wasn't it? Now, there's ways to handle that, right? Yeah. When they call your cell phone, you speak French. When they call you with a French speaker, you speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was that was my experience. Uh, it worked out okay. I got another airplane now. Uh, Claude, the, the windows you couldn't kick out, how thick were they? I don't know. The but that was a 91 model and they were stock. So well, the reason I ask that question is I know a lot of the early 70s, 80s vintage Grubbins came with very, very thin side windows. Yeah. On my travel, I think the rear quarter windows were like 16th of an inch thick, yeah. and side windows were 8th inch, but I think they were thicker on the later ones. Well, they, I think they did, because they, 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 that was one of the things they did with the AGs, was put more uh, to make them quieter. quieter. Well, the reason uh, I bring this up yeah. is that I bet you a lot of people in here with those older airplanes put in double thickness windows along the way, because yeah. it, was a, it was a noise reduction yeah. issue. And of course, since then, everybody now has acting noise reduction headsets, and they really don't need those double thickness windows in the airplane anymore. Yeah. They've still got them. Yeah. And they're carrying around twice as much weight and plexiglass as they need to, and they also have windows they can't kick out. Well, the other thing, too, you've got to remember, though, it's leverage. You know, I mean, it, it's kind, it was kind of hard to get my foot over there to try to get a straight shot at it. You know, so I kept, you know, I tried it with my fist, and I went, bam. Of course, the water, the pressure of the water on the outside, too. Uh, but remember the discussion on the gang in 2001, the early part of the year, about these little hammers for breaking yeah. car windows? Yeah. Yeah. I actually had Garner bring old windows still in salvage frames for people to try their hammers out, to try kicking out, and nobody took advantage of them. Mm -hmm. So I went over and tried to break one I could. Yeah, they're, 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 a little hammer. That yeah. hammer's from glass, mm -hmm. yeah. not they're, they're some, the, 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 uh, the tool bar, though, you got enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you got a tool bar back there, that, that, that will work. I was bringing the Tiger back across the country, I was moving, uh, I had heard rumors within the corporate level that uh, there was a possibility of a sale, and there were no guarantees on job, so I said, alright, I'm going to take advantage of corporate travel, I'm going to take my Tiger back home to the east, if I do stay with the new company, I'll just work out of the Toronto office, or if they can just buy me out. So I was coming back, and uh, the first day, not a problem, flew all across, um, went up at Idaho Mountains, was going direct to um, Thermopolis, and it was when I was climbing through 14,000 feet that I just, something just didn't feel right, and I just said, you know, I'm going to divert down to Rock Springs for fuel, because I want to get in flatter land. And I went down to Rock Springs, took on fuel from Rock Springs to Valentine, Nebraska, hot afternoon late September, I figured, oh, my oil temperature's a little up, my oil pressure's a little low, it's a hot day, I'm up high, okay, no big deal. Landed at Valentine, checked my oil, I was a half quart down, 
but I hadn't checked it in a while. Uh, I run it six and a half hours at six, no big deal. Popped it off to six and a half in the morning at Valentine, dropped in fuel, took off, uh, went up to my normal cruise altitude to stay out of the heat of the day, you know, 9,500, 11,500. Got up there, got the cruise and looked over and went, why is my oil temperature high? It was cool. And my oil pressure was still a little low. And I said, well, I'll have it looked at when I get home. What the heck? Maybe it didn't like Idaho. And as I landed at Muscatine, which is the Pearl Button capital of the world, Iowa, I picked on fuel. I'm two hours now out of home. I took off. It was into departure. Oh, and I added a quart of oil. And I went, why did I use a quart of oil? Oh, I don't know. So I said, well, you know, get home itis, one of those five rules that'll get you killed. So I jumped in the airplane and I took off. Now my oil pressure was not as high on run-up as it normally is. And I looked at it and said, well, okay, it's in the green. It's not where it should be, but what the heck did that, you know, like homing builds a lot of tolerance in their stuff. So it was in the climb out, and I was doing a gradual climb out to keep things cool, running a little extra fuel through it to keep it cool, but at 4,700 feet, I was scanning around for traffic when I felt the engine ooh, roll back. And I went, what? And I looked over, and oil pressure was pegged, and the an oil temperature was pegged all the way over at red line, and the pressure was doing this. And I went, okay. I leveled out, throttled back, punched nearest GPS, 12.7 miles airport. Okay, I can make that. So I started heading for Galesburg, uh, Illinois. Uh, needless to say, about four miles out, I started hearing valve. At that point, the oil pressure got to zero. About 10 seconds after that, I'm like, this is not bad. I had a choice at that point of two roads, one with traffic, power lines and trees, and then a gravel road out of glide range between soybean fields. And I figured, well, what the heck, I can always take the soybean field. At this point, I'm thinking, I can feather the engine, just shut it down, land on the road. Okay, but then I might ding up the frame. So I said, that's it. And then when the valve tap had started in, I said, that's it. I'm gonna go for the other road. I just gave everything forward, bought me 20, 20 seconds of thrust, the prop actually stopped in about three places. It went doo, doo, doo. Torqued the airplane over, did my emergency check, set up on the road, and I went ahead and went downwind first and couldn't figure out why the flaps were not coming down and nobody was talking in the radio. Masters off. Turned it back on. <laughs> Galesburg Unicom, Tiger 23 Julie Keel, make an emergency landing on the road approximately 3.7 northwest, landing to the west. 23 Julie Keel, no problem. Shut down. Dropped the flaps, landed on the road, and walked. A lot like landing in Alaska for those of you who've been there. You land on gravel. Not a problem. I'm glad I didn't choose the soybean field because halfway through my landing roll, there was a gully about 20 feet deep, and that would have been real bad. So I landed on the roll. I did roll one arrow on to avoid a big pothole, but I landed on this gravel road, jumped out of the airplane with the fire stinger, popped open the cow for fire, and there was nothing because when the engine stopped, a big puff of white smoke. It came in through the vents, very disconcerting, but it went right away, and I went, okay, no fire. Oh, great, great deal. Got it on the ground. Put the fire extinguisher away, walked around to the front, looked around, and then your heart starts to pound. Then your knees get wobbly. Car comes down the road. You okay? Yeah. My wife said, your airplane was really quiet. And I said, you know, his propeller's not moving, honey. It's okay. Which, which I was at that point. Come on in, Dave. So a couple of minutes later, a Cessna comes out of the airport and starts circling around. And I'm trying to get on the radio, tell the system, okay, what I didn't notice was I landed at 75 miles an hour on a, on a shell road, white shell. There was white, what appeared to be white smoke just bleeding across the field. As soon as the Cessna spotted the smoke, aircraft on fire, aircraft down, roll. No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And not listening, about three minutes later, sirens. At that point it was, I can't tell you what order it was, but the final count was five sheriffs, because I was right on the edge of two counties, <laughs> two state troopers, two ambulances, local cops. First thing the ambulance does is we need to, you know, we need to check your blood pressure. My numbers were a little high, my heart rate's a little fast. She goes, do you have high blood pressure? <laughs> Are you a trained EMT? I, I just had an emergency landing. What's your name? Dr. Henry Roche. Well, would you like to see a doctor? I have, I'm fine. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so, that was fine. They took the information, I signed it. As I walked out of the ambulance, the next group of said, we gotta, we gotta examine you. No, you can go get a photocopy of my paperwork. <laughs> Sheriff walked up, wanted to examine my, you know. I did find out later 
that if they did want, I mean, they really could have seen my pilot's license if they wanted. I was wrong when I told him there was no intention to fly. He could have examined my pilot's license. But he didn't know that, and it all worked out okay. <laughs> so half an hour after all this is over, the only thing the state trooper wanted was me to move the airplane to a gate hole. So he said, we got lots of people here. And I said, well, I want to pick them. Because I had all these guys ready to just grab the airplane and move it. And they're grabbing, you know, uh, rudder, elevator, aileron. No, no, don't bless the airplane. I said, you, you, and you. You on the wingtip, you on the wingtip, you with me on the prop. And we pulled it down the road and backed it into a gate hole off the gravel road for the farm traffic. After we got there, they looked around. They said, do you need anything? No, I'm fine. So one sheriff walked up and said, the FBAA at Galesburg would like to talk to you. In my pocket. So they all go away. So now it's now 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a half an hour after my emergency landing, and I'm all alone in the middle of nowhere with soybean fields. <laughs> well, they just left me there with the airplane. Now, one farmer did come up and asked, did I need a ride to town? I said, no, I have an ice chest. I've got a case of wine, 60 pounds of cheese. And I, was pretty <laughs> I, I, had, I was not worried for provisions. I had food. I had drink. Like Claude, I picked up the phone. Hi, Luann. <laughs> I'm not going to be home tonight on time. Um, me and the plane are fine. We're just on the ground. And I'll be called. I'll call the mechanic. Then I called my mechanic and said, "You need to come pick me up in the truck. I'm on. I'm in Galesburg. I'll call you later and tell you right where." Went to the GPS. Got a GPS location. Wrote that down. Sat down and wrote out everything I could remember of the emergency and put it on paper. Having nothing to do now, I said, "Well." I didn't do anything. I'm going to call the FAA. I called the FAA Galesburg, and he listened to what I had to say. It was fine. Just please call the FISDO in Springfield. So I called the FISDO in Springfield, and the guy kept me on the phone for like 45 minutes on hold, on back, where my cell phone battery died. But he finally said, okay, well, we'll be in touch with you later. Greg, Greg, did you call Greg and me? Talked to Greg and me. I think it was my phone was dying. You know, and then my corporate phone was dying. So, didn't know where you were. Yeah, and didn't know where I was. So what I finally did was the UPS guy came by and said, where am I? And he told me right where I was, the name of the street, and I took the GPS coordinates, I put them into Microsoft Streets and Map, and I knew right where I was so that I could get tonight, the next night, people to get right to me. And then the locals started coming by. They go, hey, we heard about the airplane crash. They go, well, take me to me. I've never seen one. <laughs> and then the other group of people would point the airplane. You know, there's an airport just right over there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's where I was trying to go. <laughs> so we had, we had a lot of curiosity seekers. Um, so my mechanic said, well, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you start taking the airplane apart for the trailer? I've done this many a time. So I pull off my toolbox, wing tips off, start loosening brackets. I had nowhere to put the fuel, and I didn't want to dump 46 gallons of fuel into a ditch. So I left all the fuel lines, and I didn't have the tools for the tail. So when the farmer came by and said, well, is there anything I can do for you? Do you need something to eat? No, I said, I've got plenty of food. Could you charge my cell phone, and could you bring me a 3 8 inch and a 7 16 and a 9 16 He would be happy to. Get the tail off. He sat there, he goes, well, it didn't take long to do that at all. <laughs> nope, it got all that. He brought me two beers when I finished that. <laughs> brought me back my cell phone. And now, I've got really nothing to look at, no cell phone to talk on. Finally, one of the emergency people came back because he wanted to show his wife a crash site. <laughs> and he says, is there anything we can get you? I said, well, the bugs are starting to get kind of bad. It's summer. Could you bring me some cigars or something to smoke to keep the bugs out? So I basically hung around until 1.45 in the morning when they arrived. And they're going, where are you? I said, I've got the beacon on. Just turn down this road. I'm the first grumman on the left. <laughs> But Microsoft Streets and Maps is wonderful. I'm going, okay, you're on I-74. You get off at the Main Street exit, go down. The, I mean, I, I talked them right in. Um, also, while I was sitting there, I had nothing to do. So before daylight ended, I inventoried from the military. You know, when you can inventory your resources, I inventoried everything I had in the airplane. Then I had all these control services. Okay, if I would have crashed in Idaho, how would I have built a shelter? So I tried all the different ways of, like, putting the... Um, the tail section against the back of the wing and using other pieces to try to build a little shelter under the wing. I tried laying down on the canopy cover under the wing in the grass to get some sleep, waiting for them. But the people kept coming by and talking to you. And what are you going to say? You know, hi. You can't, yeah, no, it's the first time for me, too. <laughs> a lot of fun. When we got, the air, we got the airplane home and we began to look at what had actually come. We knew we had a loss of pressure. We knew we had thrown a connecting rod because when I popped the cowling, this is what I saw, the end of a connecting rod sticking up. Well, I would, but 
There we go. Oh my. Now, oh, 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 hold on, it gets better. So we saw that, and there was all black oil everywhere, and it was, and then some of the oil was gray. We went, oh, it must have been making metal maybe a little bit. So that's what we saw first. I said, I threw a connecting rod. No big deal. And I thought all the oil had come out of there. That explained the white smoke on the exhaust. As we began to disassemble the case, in the, whoops, in the bottom of this one, you'll notice that there's a ding here. When we pulled the case off, this piece of the connecting rod was beat into the case, literally as part of the case. Couldn't pry it out. We eventually hammered it out. As we got it apart, we saw the other part of the morphology. A little yeah. lightning hole to speed mod. <laughs> <laughs> now, the number two connecting rod must have spun a bearing because it was losing oil pressure. This is what, a, well, this is badly scored because it's from another cylinder, but this is what a connecting rod bearing on the main crank should look like. This is the, this is a piece and this is a piece of bearing foil. A bearing heated up by spinning around and being extruded out the side of the fitting. Now, while that was going on, I had oil pressure. When it finally came out, there was too much of a gap. I couldn't have any oil pressure and it just all ran out the bearing and that was why the catastrophic Boring. Pieces of the connecting rod, I mean, it was hot. I mean, the journal looks like molten lava. I mean, it's just destroyed. The, there was hardly anything in the engine. If you don't think that an engine can put some torque, when it stops, I mean, it literally torques the airplane. Um, bent push rod, broken tappet. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there's a piece that was held on by a bolt. That's a big chunk out of this center section down here. These are just all the pieces out of the aircraft. We didn't find them all. But one of the things, I, I, I looked at the engine and I, I looked at the log, I went back and examined the log books. Airplane was bought from, uh, George Chambliss bought it from Fletch Air after a prop strike as one of the trainers. They did an engine tear down and a rebuild. George Chambliss kept it on Jekyll Island. I took it, I've raced it, I've, I had 2,053 hours on it. I quit racing it in 2002 because it reached the point where engine at 1,850 hours, I'm not gonna race anymore. And I was happy with that decision. So I called up ECI and I said, tell me about your complete engine kits. And they told me what they do, what they did. So I ordered a complete engine kit, which is a complete engine sans case bolts. So I called them back, I said, how do I bolt the case together? Well, use your old ones. <laughs> well. A lot of my old ones are bent. <laughs> you don't think there's some torque when an engine comes apart. And that's that piece. And this, I don't know where the bolt is, but I've got the nut and the washers on it. <laughs> I mean, the bolt, I didn't want to reuse anything from the old engine. There was just so much metal in that. I mean, I brought just bits and pieces that, not all of them. I mean, the, but surprisingly enough, none in the screen. That's how fast it all happened. So, I mean, the filter didn't have much metal in it at all. So my decision was to go with a complete new ECI engine. And when I said that, he said, you had an engine failure, didn't you? And I went, yeah, why? He says, yeah, most people who go for overkill, they want all new reliability. I said, no, we don't want to ever do this again. <laughs> because I had seen Just terrain in Idaho that I would not have wanted to land in. Uh, now, if I would have had a chainsaw and I could have lived there for a couple of years, it might have been a different thing. Can there I call you back? in Nebraska I could have put it down in, but I'd have been miles okay. in Wyoming yes. from anywhere. I'll call, I'll call you back with you. And who would have known? So we began reassembling. At, uh, we put the new engine back together. But there were other things that were going on in this engine. Remember the piston pin AD for the uh, wrist pins? Mine were replaced. I, I paid a mechanic to replace all, you know, tear my engine apart, pull all four cylinders and replace the piston pin. Seven out of eight were done. This one was not. Number two? Number three cylinder. Now, what happened was, the one that was good moved, the bad ones would jam and force the piston across into the cylinder wall. And as you can see, this had been rubbing for uh, about 100 hours on the cylinder wall. And of course, when you pull the cylinder out, you get a whole bunch of these on the ground. Yeah. Yep. So there was just, at that point, you know, not gonna do. The only thing off that engine we used is, a, uh, is the data plate. Now, ECI does not make an A4K engine, so if you want one, you have to order an A4M, reuse your sump, reuse your tubes to your cylinders, and that's all you need to do. 
One thing I like about the A4M is the oil field, it's that canted adapter you saw in the two-place thing. It sits up on the top at an angle, you punch a hole, you let the oil field be able to spin it off. No more messy oil changes in the new tiger. All right, so that was fine. Got the airplane home, airplane's coming back together now. Uh, it's been a long, drawn-out process. The FAA, on the other hand, is another complete issue. As Fran said when I talked to Fran, she says, well, you know what Ron says, Ron said, don't call the FAA. Uh, you know, and, but Fran says, you know, I don't agree with Ron on this because you didn't do anything wrong. As a matter of fact, you did several things right. And I went, yeah, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> don't call the FAA. <laughs> First thing they wanted was they had to give me permission to tear my engine down because they were trying to decide if someone had to be sent there to come get it. They were mad at me for removing it from the field of Illinois without their permission. They didn't tell me not to. They just said, we'll call you back. They called me back a week later, like, I'm going to leave my airplane sitting out in a soy, you know, next to a soybean field. So after we tore it down, they went, OK, what's the problem? Um, number, number two, connecting on it, lost to the drone. How many hours on the engine? 2053. All right, we want to see the logbook records of the engine. So we sent them from the last annual forward. No, no, we want to see all the logs. Not required by law. All they can ask for is the ones from the last annual, which is all we sent them. They asked for them again and said, you're not entitled to them. You're not going to get them. Not that I had anything to hide, but I guess I ticked them off because the next thing they said, okay, photocopies of your logbook for the last two years, photocopies of your medical, your BFR, everything. They pulled every string looking for something wrong. They didn't find anything. Finally, in January 30th, they called me up and said, Okay, all we want you to do now is follow an NDR with the FAA of what happened. So, connecting rod was thrown, loss of oil pressure, submitted it, we're done with the FAA. But, that's just hanging over your head, so... NTSB didn't get involved, you were. Nope, they didn't come talk to me at all, but the FAA was, uh, I was, I mean, I could tell who's, who it was by their voice on the phone, I talked to them so much for a while. And, uh, so I should have, I should have taken Ron's advice and not call him, but, uh, that's, just my thing. Well, the NTSB did get involved with mine. That's, that's on there. He's doing it. Yeah. Did you uh, file a NASA report? Uh, no, I didn't. What did you do wrong? I didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Yeah, but now what, what well, would have been the ramifications of not having called <laughs> yeah. If they eventually called you and said, we heard that you crashed. I didn't crash. You heard wrong. Mm -hmm. What crash? I made a beautiful landing on a road. Did, did you qualify as a mini Uh No, because there was an intention of flight. I was in flight, so there's an intention of flight, so it's not an incident. An incident. You had to break something. An incident is like at, Co at Cody One, we actually had somebody taxi into Ken's airplane and, and pretty much total two airplanes. But because he was only repositioning on the field, there was no intention of flight. It wasn't even an incident. So, no, but more. You know, I wish I would have had a lawyer, an aviation lawyer with me when I did go talk to a mouthpiece. Uh, but that didn't happen. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, give me some questions real quick and maybe it'll pop something in my mind. Wow, okay. I will say one thing. Uh, if, if it happens and you get in a situation like this, don't start thinking about, damn it, i got to save this airplane. Yeah, that's it. For, you know, forget the airplane. Yeah, my only thought was is I know how hard wings are to come by and stuff like that. So like I explained to Ron Levy that when I had a choice of the two roads, I opted for the one that would allow me to save the fuselage because I wasn't going to use a lot, whole lot on that engine anyway. I didn't think it was going to come apart quite that badly, to tell you the truth. But I did want to save the fuselage because the engine was going to be toast anyway. Uh, you opted for the road with the power line? No, I, I used the thrust to kill the engine to buy me the other road. Without it, there was traffic, there were trees, and there were power lines, and Lord knows how that would have worked out. Um, it, obviously, I might have, I might have, I didn't know how wide that road was, but what I liked about that gravel road and the soybean, there was no fences, nothing. It was just gravel and soybean fields, and the road was fairly wide. And there was a good 10 or 12 foot section between where the road was and the soybean began. And I, I knew that was at least 50 feet, so I knew I had plenty of clearance on my wings. And I didn't see anything. I mean, I've heard stories of people who, oh, perfectly good road and then tore the wings because they didn't see the street signs. So my choice was to save the fuselage. 
called my insurance company. Actually, got a thank you, got a thank you card from Norris because it was a non-event from insurance. He didn't have to pay out. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to relate the phone conversation. Yeah, because my phone rings. Greg, hey, Roscoe. I had provisions. Some, we, we found some cheeses we liked in Idaho. So I had 60 pounds of sharp white cheddar. And I had a case of wine. I had a cooler full of Diet Coke and sandwich makings. Um, mustard, candy bars. I, I mean, I was, I was covered. I was perfectly happy. No, no, no. I left the wings on. Larry, Larry got there. We drained the fuel out of the cans, and then we slid the wings on. That's all we had left, and then we backed it over the ditch to get it onto the trailer and loaded it. It took about three hours to load everything. Now we're doing this in the dark. Uh, they arrived at 1.45 and we pulled out at quarter to six in the morning and uh, it was it got light as we were driving out and of course we had been up all day so we got to the we got home at 1.30 we parked the trailer on the side of the hangar and it was too early to go to bed so we walked to the house got showers because we were filthy and at five o'clock they basically had a barbecue like hey welcome home Roscoe tell us what happened and we regaled them for about 90 minutes and they finally said you want you want to start drinking? You know, actually, I really just want to go home and go to bed right now. Uh, I was just whooped. I've been up for like a day and a half. You want me to tell them about the tiger force landing I had? Okay. It wasn't a Grumman tiger. It was a flying tiger plane. Ah. <laughs> I was a cadet, and uh, we were flying AT-6s. But then we got some flying tigers, the P-40 flight time. And the first time you fly in, it's by yourself. No duel. On my third flight, I climbed up out of Craig Field, Selma, Alabama, at 8,500 feet. And I was checking the props and everything out. And look, the oil pressure was on zero. So I called the tower and told them there's an auxiliary grass landing strip below me and I was going to land. And they said, circle watch. Circle. Engine's still running good. They figured it was a, the gauge, not, not the actual in pressure. So they said, come back to the main base. So I started back, letting down, opened the canopy, just in case I had to bail out. I was about halfway back at 4,000 feet, and the engine blew, oil all over the windshield. I was lucky, right off to my left was another auxiliary grass landing strip, and I set it down there and didn't hurt the plane. Later I asked the uh, mechanic what was wrong with the engine. They said, we don't know, we just put it back and then send it back to the factory. <laughs> but anyway, when I graduated, they made me an AT-6 instructor. Maybe that was why, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not, I have not been a fan of doing this. I, I didn't do it with my engine because, you know, just the history of it. We had, the oil was kind of gray and thick as we looked at it coming, so obviously there was a lot of metal being made there. It might have caught the piston for me, giving me a heads up. Um, I don't want it to happen again. That's why when I, we went shopping for the two place we bought, we were looking for one with a run-out engine because I want to know what's in there now. I'm not going to take any more engines from friends who are mechanics and, oh, trust me, well, I'd fly it. My, my standards go up a little bit now. Oh. Does the insurance company not help at all on this environment? On this, this, this is not an this is not an insurance issue. issue. So, what if you had a bird strike and a prop during the landing? If I could have found a bird, throw, if I could have found a bird throwing the prop, I'd have been considering it. But, <laughs> but basically, um, you know, I pay all my taxes. I know I'm a rare bird. You know, I don't ask for discounts on the car. You know, put, don't tell them what I really pay for. I know better. Yeah, than. I know. <laughs> what? Mike. Hey, Roscoe, you talked about talking or not talking to the FAA. Uh, you want to talk about taking or not taking breathalyzer tests? Oh, oh yeah. I refused. I refused the breathalyzer test because I, I learned that when I flew for the DEA that that's not legal. They can ask you and you can volunteer, but they can't force you. State trooper. As a pilot? Huh? The state troopers over there or the FAA? State trooper can only they're only breathalyzing me to prove that I was under the influence that I was going to operate the vehicle. They usually have to do a sobriety test first. Yeah. And uh, if, if you 
told them here that in Hickory did, I don't know why they would keep the fix right. on doing that. Well, just well, like I asked the line in the vaccine. Our flight time was 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I pointed out to the state trooper, I said, every time you're telling me every time a car breaks down on I-74, you, you breathalyze them? No. What's different about me? You know, he kind of left me alone after that. Irene, you had a question? Yes. Uh -huh. Why did the mechanic skip not doing that one cylinder? If you know the shop I use, they're very hectic. Oh. And the usually, the mechanics usually like to finish one thing, but the chief mechanic likes to pull people off of jobs. Hey, drop what you're doing and come over and give me a hand. Then go back to what you're doing. And that's how, that's how they, and I it don't wasn't like. wasn't intentional then. That wasn't, was not intentional at all. It just proves that we're all human. And seven hundred dollars, it worked just fine. Yeah. Um, I can't Did read the title. Up the airplane landing with the insurance pay for that. If I had put up the airplane on landing, oh, would have been covered. Yeah, we, we it would have covered the engine. engine. Would not have covered the engine. Okay. okay. Would the insurance have paid for recovery if you were further out and didn't have your buddies a couple of hours away? Nope. No, there's, they're, they, they don't have any, you know, I could have landed at an airport in. No, no, you're in the middle of a wheat field. Um, they might have paid for the, they might have paid for the recovery. I don't know how they would do that. We'd have they to have ask have those I've recovered airplanes that landed in the middle of nowhere uh -huh. and for reason didn't get hurt. Yeah. Pick them up and they get a check for recovery. Yeah. Even well, though they're not rented. Right. And then, you know, that AY, I mean, this is for the, I'm part of group insurance. I don't want to see our rates grow up. And I know that my mechanic, what he charged me to come get me and bring me home was $500 and to pay the rent on the trailer. And I was able to work that out for working at him for $10 an hour in the shop. Well, what happened if you were you know, five states away? If I'd have been five states away, it would have been a whole different issue. I probably would have gotten a U-Haul and loaded it up myself and drove it home. The insurance company doesn't want the radios to disappear. <laughs> Their interest to get the airplane to disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, and I stayed with the airplane because there were a lot of young people going by. And considering the, the nature of the do not trespass signs that you know were down in the creek bed that had shotgun holes in them and rifle holes, <laughs> I didn't want people coming out and just hey, I've never seen an airplane before. Let's see what we can take out of them. Maybe I just stayed with the airplane. Um, I did. I, I did call her on the phone. I was trying to get some sleep in the cabin because I couldn't sleep on it, and I was hunkered down in the seat and I was trying to get comfortable. I was using Roscoe, my raising raccoon, as a pillow, <laughs> and our, our car stopped, and I. I went, okay, well, maybe they're just looking. Then I heard a car door shut, and so I sat up and flipped on the master and flipped on the battery light, and they jumped back in the car and disappeared. And I was like, aha! At that point, I said, all right, I'm not going to sleep. Apparently, insurance companies, you know, it's over and above. You know, I got my full value of the hole on mine. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they used a, you know, big, huge bell jet ranger to, well, they tried to. Yeah. Tried to pick it up the first Suck it out time. Of mud, yeah. It just kind of hung there. <laughs> and then they said, well, we'll try again tomorrow. We'll take the wings off. Mm -hmm. And they took the wings off of it. And they went to try it again. And they said, well, we're going to have to take the interior out. It's all soaked. Yeah. And then they went out and they finally got the thing out of the water. And, and this is when they really busted it up. You know, uh, they brought it over and, and they, because the windshield wasn't even broken. Yeah. It, it went, and, then, and when they, they kind of dropped it, you know, and it was, well, I can tell you from the deep south, I used to fly for the Civil Air Patrol and, you know, look for people. And when Cessnas land in the pine trees in the south, most of the time, nobody's hurt. The, the airplane comes to a full stop and they're 15 to 30 feet up in the air. So what do they do? They open the door and look down and go, huh, and they pop their seatbelt. Fall out and break an arm or a leg. <laughs> any, more, uh, any more questions? Gil, you had a question. No, I got to Oh, okay. Well, we're done early. Thank you very much, and I hope you, you never have one of these.